One thing I should say uh, early uh, uh, is that in meeting in this lovely room in, we, in which we are, uh, I think, as I acknowledge the traditional owners, how they would love to meet here uh, with us. Uh, the original traditional owners, uh, of course, uh, met down by the banks of the Yarra here, and I often think when I, I give a talk about those topics, uh, how the traditional owners would look at us now, 200 years on, uh, the way we've developed their land. Uh, Aboriginal people love to sit down and talk and discuss issues and come to shared solutions, uh, and that's what was missing, of course, from the government intervention in the Northern Territory. Uh, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, I've been in the Territory now for 18 years, which is very short uh, in the space of time. Uh, anyone who didn't uh, live in the Territory uh, before 1974, which was uh, the year of Cyclone Tracy, uh, is regarded pretty much as an interloper. Uh, and uh, I think I need at least another cyclone to descend upon us uh, before I'll be regarded as a local. Uh, there are people here in this room, uh, I know, who are much more experienced in these matters than I am, uh, but I nevertheless uh, uh, am, com am confident because of the work that Pat and I did and the knowledge she had and the assistance we had from other people and, more importantly, from the people we met around the whole of the Northern Territory, uh, that what appears in our report uh, is an accurate uh, uh, description of what we found. Can I, I just remind you of this, that... Uh, the report itself uh, was into children's uh, sexual abuse, but we made it very clear uh, in the material that we presented to government uh, and in the material that we distributed uh, publicly, uh, including to the Commonwealth Government um, in this connection, uh, that Aboriginal people... And I'll just read from... This was a little handout we prepared, which has our lovely artwork on the front which the same as on the 300-page report, which some of you may have seen. Uh, and we said, what the inquiry learned. So this was a handout to help people understand without having to read the whole of the 300 pages. And we said, important points made by the inquiry included child sexual abuse is serious, widespread and often unreported. OK, so that's the thing the federal government jumped on. Right. Secondly, most Aboriginal people are willing and committed to solving problems and helping their children. They are also eager to better educate themselves. Thirdly, Aboriginal people are not the only victims and not the only perpetrators of sexual abuse. Well, don't we all know that? Uh, any of you who are involved in the criminal justice system would know that that is the case. Uh, furthermore, much of the violence and sexual abuse occurring in territory communities is a reflection of past, current and continuing social problems which have developed over many decades. Now, that wasn't any brilliant rocket science, as we keep saying in our report, uh, that was the findings of many, many people over many, many years. Uh, and I'll just ask uh, Stephen, Stephen, we have a cartoon which uh, shows this in some uh, graphic form. Uh, there's a man called Pugley who uh, commented at some stage when a new report came out uh, and he said, what do they do with all these reports uh, in government? Do they use them as doorstops? Uh, do they stick them up in their bedside cupboards to look at uh, sometime in the future? Uh, or what do they do with them? Uh, so this uh, was a cartoon that appeared just a couple of weeks ago in the Northern Territory News. Wicking is our uh, cartoonist up there. Uh, and uh, the person in the, uh, uh, in the television set you might recognise. Uh, so the Prime Minister had announced uh, there was going to be this new uh, report, a new uh, proposals... Uh, and uh, I hope you can all read it there clearly enough. Uh, our norm character is the common character in the Territory uh, who we use as the butt of all our jokes. Uh, and here we are, another report, another report, another report. Uh, when will we ever read the ones we've already got? Uh, and I make that point, I think, in the, in the little handout that uh, you'll get uh, in due course. Uh, so I was concerned when I read this report, and this is what diverted me when I read this press release, diverted me from other things I was going to talk about, uh, because it seemed as if the penny had finally dropped. And these people in government, led by this person in the television screen, are finally waking up to what is being said out there in the communities. And I, I draw your attention uh, to what, uh, what the Prime Minister's press release 
uh, said uh, at the time, uh, and she said, and this is uh, on or about the 21st of June, which is the fourth anniversary uh, of the invasion of the Northern Territory, and she said this, uh, well, whoever wrote this for her said it, the Australian government has identified three priority areas, has identified three priority areas. Wonderful. They've identified these priority areas. And what are they? Firstly, school attendance and educational achievement. Well, was this the first time this had been identified? Ensuring all children go to school and succeed. Do your children go to school? Hands up anyone here who's got children who are not going to school, don't have to go to school. Nobody. All right, we expect our children to go to school. So they've identified that as an important matter. Well done. <laughs> Uh, secondly, economic development and employment, well that's obviously important and might flow, you might think, from education. Uh, thirdly, tackling alcohol abuse, ensuring people and communities do not go on suffering the devastation caused by, the, by too much alcohol, well that's obvious too. Now, just bear in mind that when we wrote our report, and please let me be very modest about this. There's nothing in it which was brilliant or new. We were just collating uh, what people had told us and what we'd read and what we saw in going around the Territory. We identified the two major things, and this is our report, which was actually uh, completed on April the 30th, uh, 2007, although it wasn't publicly released for a few months, uh, a few weeks later, but government had it, the Territory government had it. And we identified the two major things as education and alcohol abuse. OK, four years later, the Prime Minister suddenly realises they're the major things. Well, that's, that's good, at least they're identifying it. And it's, it's unfair of me to say it quite so blandly because, of course, those matters have been addressed in the years between. Uh, but to say they're now being identified as priorities is ridiculous. And it just goes on to say, and this is important, uh, and I've addressed this in my, my paper for you, the consultation which is going to follow on the further directions, the new directions in the Territory, uh, is going to involve uh, uh, meeting people, public meetings, uh, to be held in Darwin and regional centres in the Northern Territory. Bear in mind this is all about the Northern Territory. Uh, so public meetings, community meetings to be held in communities across the Northern Territory and feedback sessions where small groups and individuals and communities give their views to government staff. That's what we did for eight months uh, in 2006 and 2007. It's exactly what we did. And we went to 46 communities. Uh, we had uh, 260 individual uh, meetings with people separate to those community meetings where we would uh, descend upon the place uh, with warning and have meetings with people who discussed uh, very, uh, uh, I think, sincerely and openly the problems in their communities. Uh, and just as a by question, um, how many of you in Fitzroy, here or wherever you live, uh, would attend a meeting tomorrow night to discuss sexual abuse of children in Fitzroy? Uh, how many would turn up? Zilch, I suspect. And yet, these people would come to these meetings to discuss, frankly, the problems they had uh, and with people who were, uh, to some extent, strangers, but who went to them um, sincerely on our part, uh, openly, and with a little bit of authority. Uh, interestingly enough, when I would sit down with the old people, uh, or the elderly people, I'd say, I'm older than most of you. You can look at me and see how old I am. Uh, and Pat, uh, about my age, I think, Pat Anderson, who we worked together closely on this, and we sat down with our, with the women and the men and then with joint meetings, uh, and we earned some respect. Now, I think that's important that Aboriginal people deal with people of the same level, uh, whatever level you strike, uh, that they can address and give you the respect which they expect themselves. And that's missing entirely from what's happened uh, in the last four years. So they're, they're the brilliant uh, decisions that have been made. They're going to consult finally, uh, which is what we recommended four years ago, consultation, cooperation, talk to the people, listen to the people, get them to suggest their solutions and work through them together. Now, if that happens now, that's wonderful uh, and we hope it does, but it's taken four years and it's another four years wasted of young lives 
uh, in the interim period while the matters that we recommended and other people have recommended have not been carried out. So there's a great sadness in this. I've said this on other occasions too. Uh, each year of the intervention, we should be celebrating uh, the birthday of the, uh, of the intervention, the interference, the response to the Northern Territory emergency. Wonderful things have been happening, but that's not the way it is. Each year we get another protest. The people are not been happy. Now, this is interesting. Uh, the Minister, Jenny Macklin, uh, who is, I'm sure, a well-meaning person, and I suspect Mal Bruff was as well, uh, but I never met him, so I don't know. Uh, Julia, sorry, Jenny Macklin said this. This is in her foreword to this new, new report, the new report on the report on the report. Uh, and Jenny says this. Uh, through our efforts and investments over the past four years, we've made some progress. Well, that's good. When I speak with people in remote communities and in towns like Alice Springs particularly, women, they tell me they and their families feel safer, their children are better fed and clothed and their money is being spent. OK, so that's a positive from some people, from some communities who are happy with their money being diverted uh, and uh, being spent uh, in a way that they haven't uh, themselves uh, particularly uh, requested. Uh, and there are many people who don't feel that way uh, in the Aboriginal communities. She goes on to say, I've heard from many people that the way the Northern Territory emergency response was introduced by the previous government without consultation has caused ongoing fear, anger and distrust amongst Indigenous people and communities. Well, as I've said in the handout, that was in June 2007. In November 2007, that government was voted out and the Rudd government was voted in. Uh, the wonderful uh, reconciliation statement was made, but the emergency response continued, despite the fact that Aboriginal people had really thought, this is the Territory people, that this government, this new government, would change things. And then, of course, this government continues it. So we're now going into the fifth year of the emergency response uh, with suspension of the uh, Discrimination Act, Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, and in that connection, I know I should really talk about human rights more than I talk about these other things, but the whole, the whole of the intervention involves human rights in my, uh, in my view. Uh, have a listen to what uh, the Minister says uh, about, the, uh, about the Human Rights Act. And what does she say here? All future actions, and this is again in June 2011, all future actions taken by the government will comply with the Racial Discrimination Act, either because they are non-discriminatory or because they are special measures. Now, you heard about special measures when... Megan was speaking earlier, and that special measures are what you see them to be. Special measures are actions that the government takes to help people of a particular race claim their human rights equally with the others and to protect the people who need it most. Now, they sound like weasel words to me. They are words that can be stretched in any way you like, we'll suspend human rights because we're not really suspending them. What we're doing is doing something for your benefit. Well, you can interpret that how you wish. Uh, as I say to me, it's spin, uh, which we get very much used to nowadays. Now, education, I just wanted to touch on briefly. Uh, I said earlier that uh, Pat and I regarded education and alcohol abuse as the two major issues to be uh, dealt with. And what we said in our our report, uh, and this is a recommendation, um, I'll see if I can find it for you so I can read it to you properly. Uh, I'm sorry I have papers all over the place here. Uh, recommendation number 50.2, uh, I'll read the preamble to it, 50. Given that children and young people who chronically attend, uh, who do not attend or are excluded from school are severely disadvantaged, and there is a correlation between school non-attendance and criminal activity, poverty, unemployment, homelessness, violence and sexual abuse, the government must, as a matter of high priority, ensure. And then there's a list of things, and these are under the heading of education. So 
all of these matters we regard as essential uh, to improve the lot of the Aboriginal people. And our, our second point was that every child aged three years by 1st of February 2008, to try and remember that date, 2008, should attend on or about that date and continuously thereafter a preschool program. Now our idea was that three-year-old kids should get into school immediately. And we're talking about eight months notice here. Uh, so the very next school year, we gave no time beyond that. Get those kids into school. All right, so what's happened since then? Uh, in uh, 2008, uh, they're closing the gap targets. You've heard of closing the gap, perhaps. Closing the gap targets were set by COAG, which is the Commonwealth Government or Attorney General's meeting, in 2008 relating to early childhood. And the second of their targets was to ensure access to early childhood education for all Indigenous four-year-olds in remote communities within five years. Now that's from 2008, another five years. That's their target. So our target's lost, never mentioned that I can recall, uh, and that's what's happened to that. It's completely disappeared. So then we get uh, uh, in the proposals of last week, last month, uh, we get uh, the Minister saying this, uh, early intervention activities such as creches, playgroups and family programs help children thrive. Well, hallelujah, that's what we were saying. By 2013, all children will have access to a preschool program in the year before formal schooling. Preschool provides early learning development milestones and social experiences that set children up for life. That's exactly the point we were making in 2006, 2007. Now, it seems to me, on some basic mathematics, uh, that all the children uh, who were born after the intervention up to 2013 uh, miss out on those years. So what we've said in parts of our report is a whole generation of Aboriginal people and young people uh, have not got the benefits of a decent upbringing, decent education system. They've been in abuse situations uh, either because, I'm not talking sexual abuse only, I'm talking general abuse by us, the community, uh, in the way they live uh, for now 20, 30 years maybe. And we're losing these people. So it may be that uh, Megan's able to talk to people uh, in Queensland and around Australia who are happy with the reconciliation statement. Uh, I can tell you the people in the Northern Territory aren't happy with the reconciliation statement. They might have been on the day it was made and in the month after it was made, but when it then became clear that this government was not going to do anything about the response except to continue it, uh, then that uh, faded very quickly, that, uh, that glow. So it's important, uh, uh, in my view, that we keep uh, these matters before government. Uh, the people in the Northern Territory certainly are. Uh, I note, noted when um, Sarah introduced us today introduced the whole of the day to us and talked about the last 12 months and the very many um, human rights problems around the world, uh, this little problem in the Northern Territory didn't get a run. Now, uh, it's not a new problem, I know, but it is a continuing problem and we should not lose sight of it. Uh, if we are to lose sight of it, uh, then I'm afraid uh, governments uh, will continue to have more reports day after day after day, uh, year after year, and they'll get filed away, as Pugley said, uh, and used as doorstops, uh, and uh, nothing will come of them. It is, it is time. Now, I know they're difficult problems, and I'll say this is the final thing. Uh, I know they're difficult problems, but the money's there. All it needs is the will. Uh, and I read somewhere, and I wish I'd brought this with me, something that uh, Megan said, I triggered this in my mind. Where is the love? Where is the love? Now, we have to find that love between our community, represented here by most of you who... Uh, I know there are some Indigenous people here, uh, but mostly not, uh, and the Aboriginal people. Uh, we need that love uh, between us all. 
Thank you. For a talk that raises a whole host of um, very interesting issues, if we do have time for a few minutes of questions, um, perhaps the first one I see um, up the back there. Yes, hello. I um, visited the Tiwi Islands not long ago and found, um, and we worked with children there, and found that the sense of community uh, responsibility for the children and um, for supporting and perpetuating the Tiwi culture was really strong. Um, it was very much about local solutions to local schooling issues and there, was local, there were local supported businesses that meant that children could stay in the community and work through and become a part of their own culture. Um, you mentioned how it, Aboriginal people like to sit down and work out their own solutions to their own problems and there's also been a lot of academic work been done in the last few years about place-based solutions, community partnerships, local solutions to local problems. I'm wondering why do you think there is so, there appears to be so much resistance at a government level to just getting down and doing the work at a local level and within local communities coming up with their own solutions? Because there's plenty of evidence that it's very effective. I think, uh, I think the answer is, and it's very perceptive of you, but the, the answer is this, that uh, when the intervention started, it started in a week's bunkered down work by Mal Bruff and the people in Canberra and the bureaucrats there, uh, because I suspect, and I hope I'm not being too sceptical here, uh, that there was an election coming up uh, and they thought there was some mileage to be made out of this, a win-win situation when you think about it. Uh, they're moving into the territory, uh, moving quickly, money, tanks, major generals, uh, going all at once, and they lost sight of the words that were used uh, in the report, which were all about consultation and were all about different solutions for different people. Uh, now, I don't think we use the expression uh, one size doesn't fit all because I don't like it much, but, uh, and I wouldn't have written it, but uh, that's the, the view we took. Uh, was that it had to be individual solutions. And the sitting down with people is the other important aspect of it. Uh, we did a lot of that. Uh, and although at the outset of the, our work we said we're not going to sit under every damn gum tree in the Northern Territory, uh, I reckon we sat under a few uh, in that time. And people respect you when you sit down and talk with them and then they offer things. It does take time. And I think uh, if you were to say to, to Mr Bruff or Mr Howard, why did you move so quickly? Why didn't you consult, as the report said? They would have said, the time for talking's over. Uh, but of course, the time for talking has only started. Uh, and they overlooked that. They wanted to get in and have a big, quick kill uh, in political terms. So I agree absolutely with you. Uh, different solutions for different places in alcohol abuse as well, uh, very important. Uh, there is a school out in Yurikala, uh, which is near uh, Nolan Boy Gove, uh, which is doing brilliant work with uh, uh, teachers who are now qualified, properly qualified Aboriginal teachers, and they talk, teach in language as well as in English, uh, uh, which is exactly what the uh, the Human Rights uh, the Human Rights Declaration talks about, as you know. Um, and uh, what can I say? I agree. Is it not true that? Um the intervention was only possible because the Northern Territory is a territory, that if um, the report had come from a state, say Queensland or um, Western Australia, that uh, the government wouldn't have been able to implement such an intervention. If a report had come from a state, um, what would the government had done, would have done in such a scenario? Well, uh, again, a very perceptive question. The government couldn't have done anything. Uh, the fact is uh, we were there and uh, they could attack us, and they did. Uh, the Northern Territory is not a state, uh, as you just said. It's a territory and all of our legislation is subject to uh, uh, the imprimatur of the federal government. Uh, they knocked out our euthanasia legislation, as you probably know, uh, and uh, they introduced uh, changes in our sentencing practices, which they can't do in other states, in, in other parts of the country. So you can't take Aboriginal customary law into account in sentencing uh, practices. We've had some 
legal arguments about that. Uh, it's because we're there and they could do it that they did it. I suppose a question that troubles me sometimes, Rex, um, is the issue of consultation and whether there ever can be or should be an end to consultation. And you um, identified one of the issues with the consultation yourself when you talked about, you know, what if there was a sexual abuse um, discussion tomorrow night in Fitzroy. Um, and I wonder whether consultation fatigue is an issue for Aboriginal people uh, if you, to the extent that there's a perception that um, you know, we're going to recommend that more well-intentioned whitefellas go and sit down under more gum trees and ask Aboriginal people what are their problems and they've told us this, what the problems are for the last you know, 50 years, 100 years. Um, is there a bind? Is there an issue? Is there a point where consultation has to stop and action has to begin? Or yeah, of course, of course there is. Uh, but the, the, this particular problem was exposed in 2006, in April 2006 or thereabouts. Uh, the Mutajulu, you might remember, uh, near Ayers Rock, the, cat the Catalyst uh, community, uh, which then got a lot of publicity on ABC and then led to, uh, to our inquiry starting. Uh, and it was then that the matter was brought home, this particular matter, uh, of sexual abuse of children was first aired in the communities. Uh, they knew it was there, obviously, in some communities, um, but it was an opportunity for them to, if you like, uh, disclose what they knew and to talk about the difficulties they had, uh, which are much larger than just the uh, que question of uh, sexual abuse. Uh, so as far as that particular area of, uh, or that issue is concerned, uh, that's when the talking really started, I think. Uh, so even now, that's four years down the track, uh, you might think it hasn't stopped uh, and shouldn't stop. Uh, these things need to be sorted out. I, I've sat down with, with Aboriginal people, as many of you here have, no doubt, uh, and we've talked, of, talked about one issue for two or three hours. Uh, and then there's a whole impasse of half an hour or so where people just say nothing. And you sit there as the interloper and you're waiting for someone to say something and nothing is said and finally you say should we stop and come back tomorrow or next week or yeah yeah that'd be a good idea uh, and then they go away and talk and come back uh, it's a slow process uh, but it gets a result eventually because the result you do get is one that's worked through and thought about aboriginal elders uh, men and women are incredibly intelligent people and they have a strong knowledge of their own law uh, and respect for it, and for our law too. Uh, and it's a question of, of, of working the two things together, uh, and you do get the result eventually. Yes, in the front. Hi, thank you. Alice Palmer from the Law Institute. This is actually going back to the um, presentation um, earlier on constitutional recognition, and I just, I'm, I'm asking you to indulge me in giving me a positive answer to this question. Um, uh, do you think that constitutional recognition would change the situation that you've described? How could constitutional recognition help ensure that these problems are being addressed on the ground? Um, and, and when I ask for a positive <laughs> response to that, I'm really going to that, that plea to develop the narrative around why constitutional change is necessary. Alice, uh, it, it was not uh, a matter that was prominent in our discussions uh, with the, the people we met. Uh, however, the, uh, the feeling was always there uh, that they were being treated as lesser beings, uh, firstly by us coming in the first place, uh, but I think we satisfied them on that because of uh, what I describe as our genuine our sincerity uh, with it. Uh, but I was... This is digressing from your question a bit, but I might get to the answer. Uh, there was one man, his name is Morris Ryan, who's a very well-known Aboriginal leader uh, from Kalkarinji, and he said to me, this is all very well, you're taking notes and writing down what we're saying, uh, but when are you going to come back and report to us on what you've done about it? Um, and uh, I saw Morris uh, last month, and I said, I'm sorry I've never been back, but I haven't been allowed to come back. Uh, my, my brief was finished, as it were, and... I never got the opportunity to come back and think the government didn't want me anymore. Uh, and he accepted that. Uh, but it's the recognition that you're talking about of being lesser beings, the plane descending, white men coming out, 
pardon me by calling us white men, but white men coming out uh, and sitting down and <coughs> off again in the afternoon's plane, never to be seen again, that kind of thing, uh, which was worrying him. I think the recognition in the Constitution uh, is only a sop, I think it's my opinion, uh, but it's a valuable one. Uh, I don't think it'll do, do much, quite frankly, for that situation. <laughs> well, so your positive response would be yes or no, wouldn't it? I wish I could be more positive about all these things and enthusiastic and here's where the way we're going. And if you had Jenny Macklin here, she could do all that. Uh, but, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Rex, my name's Chris Marshall. I'm uh, with Native Title Services of Victoria. But uh, I was a community development practitioner in the Northern Territory for years. Um, uh, may I say, I think you've got to be very careful with some of your questions, some of your statements. It's, you can't really say elders in the Northern Territory are very intelligent people. You know, that is paternalistic, racist crap, um, with respect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, is a, there are huge problems in the Northern Territory Aboriginal communities that do need to be addressed. Perhaps Minister Macklin needs a, to be given... Yeah, it's easy to sort of knock a new statement. She's trying to perhaps arguably take the, the intervention in a new direction. To do that, she needs to come out with some whistle words like, you know, stronger futures or something like that. But I would like to hear you simply acknowledge the, the extent of the problems. I think you did in your report. Yes, you said they have to be addressed through consultation, and they do. And the implementation has to be undertaken in a consultative way. And whoever made the point up there was spot on. It, it's got to be done on the ground through a process of collaborative addressing of issues. But um, please give us you know, the, a statement about the extent of the problems and the, the value. You talked about the money's there, it just needs the will. The money and the will for what? Some form of... Let's not say intervention, but some sort of supportive measures. Um, so, and the love, I guess, is, yeah, let's have love. But um, I suppose that simply means a collaborative approach and respectful approach. But don't undersell the extent of the problems. Um, don't um, dismiss what um, uh, the minister is trying to do, rather clumsily, because that's the nature of government always in these things, because the problems are huge. Chris, thanks for that. Uh, the point, one of the part of the points I'm making is in this, is in this report up here. Uh, when, uh, when Mr Howard announced the intervention in 2007, there was a, uh, a cartoon, which was a Melbourne one, I think, uh, and it, it had about 10 boxes. And the first box was 2001, oh, we've got big problems in Aboriginal communities. Uh, report, and then 2002 and 2003, and then in 2007, we've got big problems in Aboriginal communities. Let's go into the Northern Territory. Brackets, there's an election this year. Close brackets. So a very sceptical view by the cartoonist, which, which I agree with. OK, there is a huge problem. And in fact, uh, we wrote this report, 300 pages long, talking about the problems. Uh, and we said uh, that the, the worst scenario, worst final result in a... Uh, dysfunctional society uh, would be sexual abuse of children. You start up here and you come down the middle somewhere, there's, a, well, not in the middle, but there's, a, there's physical violence in respect of women and men, men as well, remember, but, but mainly women we'd have to concede. Uh, I, I don't have to concede, it's the fact. Uh, and then at the bottom level there's uh, physical and sexual abuse of children. But it starts up here with the dysfunctionality of the community right from the top. Now, the thing that I talked about, the elders, because I met, I met such people. Now, I agree that I didn't meet every elder in the Northern Territory and it was a, perhaps you'd say, a gross generalisation to say they're all intelligent people. The fact is the elders who still, uh, uh, who still are in that senior position in various communities are generally educated uh, and speak English. Now, they're, those are men of perhaps your age, uh, and, and not much younger. Because the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, because generations move pretty quickly, 15 years perhaps in the Territory, 
uh, are not as educated and getting less educated uh, and do not have the respect for the elders they started with. And to some extent this is because those elders have let them down uh, because they've been uh, abusers of alcohol. Uh, and then this next range are uh, abusers again. Uh, so unfortunately, and I've said this privately and I, I hate to say it publicly, but it's probably the fact there's a generation there missing. And I don't know. I mean, some of them play football and that's wonderful, but football's not the only thing that kids should be doing. So we, there's a generation of, I don't know, I'm not going to say what years, that we're going to struggle to ever get back into a proper community way of living, a way that we accept. And they're not, they're not out there doing Aboriginal things. Uh, they're doing white fella things badly. OK, so there is that thing. So we've got the elder, the elders here that I'm talking about, uh, fine people, Harry Nelson, Murray Ryan and lots of other people I can think of that I met all around the top end uh, who have the same feelings that we all have about what should happen in the communities. Uh, but we've not supported them because uh, the respect that they should have from the rest of their community, and I'm talking men and women, don't misunderstand me, men and women as the elders, uh, they've lost that respect. The younger people say, hey, why should we listen to you? The white fellas don't listen to you, why should we? Uh, so part of the collaboration is to be with the older senior people to restore their respect. So the younger people see that the white fellas come in, people like me, perhaps people like you, Chris, in your previous life, uh, and talk to the old people and what are we going to do and sit down and the younger people see that these old people have got the respect of the white blokes, therefore we should give them our respect as well. And that's all upbringing as well as, as you know from your experience uh, that they've learnt their culture and the uh, rites of passage uh, as it were through that. Uh, so the problem is enormous uh, and it's because as the generations, as we're not dealing with the problem, uh, the people growing up who would be the natural leaders of the next generation are corrupted by alcohol or other things, and drugs and petrol sniffing and all those other things that have been terrible problems. And they're there. Uh, and if you want me to be pessimistic, I'll be as pessimistic as you like. Uh, but I've got to try and say something positive. I was asked in the last such talk I gave to be positive at the end, and I said, right, I'm positive. Sat down. So, good luck. <laughs>